I like easy questions. As a, as a child, I was taught the basic needs are food, water, shelter, and clothing. When I Googled recently, I found you could also add sanitation, healthcare, and education to it. So there's seven. But what if we had to choose just three? I would definitely go for food and for water because I know I can't last for more than a few hours. Medically, if you don't have water, you can live for three to five days, and if you have no food, you could last for eight weeks. What about the third one? Would you choose any of the other five? Let me give you a hint. I, I got to know of this quote a couple of years back, and it's stuck in my memory. If you think economy is more important than air, try holding your breath while you count your money. It's quite interesting and illustrates beautifully how ignorant we are with air. Every ignorance has a consequence. And ignoring something that we cannot live for more than five minutes has dramatic consequence. Based on research done by World Health Organization using 400 experts over a span of four years, air pollution is considered the biggest environmental risk today. Air pollution leads to seven million deaths every year. Compare that to AIDS, leading to one and a half million, and to malaria, 600,000. Battle with air pollution is not new. This is a picture comparing London to Beijing. This was London in 1952. This year is important because this is the year of great smog in London. It was in December of 1952 that London was hit by great smog, and within weeks, there were 8,000 casualties, and there was more than 100,000 people <coughs> suffering from sickness. This is Beijing today. It looks very similar. But let's consider London today. More than 60 years later, this is Oxford Street. I'm sure most of you have shopped here because more than a million people visit this place every day. It looks quite nice and beautiful and inviting. Is it really clean? This street, this exact street, has been voted the highest polluted street in the world. Is it really true? Well, let's talk a bit more about pollution. Air pollution is made of various kinds of pollutants that come from agriculture, cooking, transportation, and construction. It could, they come in all various sizes. It could be solids, liquids, and gases. Nitrogen dioxide, a molecule made of one atom of nitrogen and two atoms of oxygen, is invisible and quite toxic. It causes what is called as photochemical smog, and it also produces a particle the size of 120th the size of hair called particulate matter 2.5. Nitrogen dioxide has, all, has recently been in the news because of the Volkswagen scandal, where uh, the US Environmental Protection Agency has issued a notice uh, for Volkswagen cheating on emissions. Nitrogen dioxide, along with particle matter, can easily enter the lungs and enter our bloodstream. And when exposed to it for a longer time, it can cause asthma, it can cause cardiac arrest, pulmonary diseases, and also lung cancer. If a city is polluted or not, WHO sets up a threshold, and that threshold is 21 parts per billion of NO2. And what that means is you have 21 molecules of NO2 for every billion molecules in the air. As you can see, London is at 48 on an average, and peak levels at 212. That's more than 10 times. Beijing is much lesser. Now, to find out if a city is polluted or not, WHO says if the concentration is above 21 for more than 18 hours, then it's polluted. And you look at the statistics with London, it took them less than a week in the last three years to breach these limits. This is not just the case with London. 
This is the case with almost all the cities in Europe. That is Barcelona, that's Madrid, Milan, any city. What is painful is recent research shows indoor air, the air we are breathing right now, is worse than the outdoor air by a factor of five and sometimes 100. This is shocking. And I, I was exposed to this three years back by a fellow entrepreneur, and I was shocked, but also ashamed. Ashamed because I was expected to be an expert in this space. I used to work for a venture capital firm, and my responsibility was to find environmental challenges, meet on an average of 500 companies, and invest in one or two to solve this problem. And I was at this job for more than five years and had no clue. Solving air quality is not easy. It's extremely complex. We know it's invisible. We know it's all around us. It's also non-regional, meaning pollution in China can affect Central Valley in California. Forest fire in Indonesia causes smog in Singapore. Obviously, policies like reducing emission, uh, cycling, or walking helps, but it's never enough because of the complexity. We need to find a solution that would work on an individual level in a household. Well, something like this could work. I bought this can. It's actually oxygen. It contains around eight liters. That means I can breathe through it for one minute. If you Google, you'll find quite a few companies that are trying to sell this. It's not a bad idea, it's quite interesting. Simple, but if you needed to use it every day, this is how you would look. <laughs> it's really cool, I would love to look like this, but not every day. So what can we do? Is there any inspiration we can draw? Maybe from the best inventor on the planet. Pollution is not new. There's been volcanoes, there have been forest fires through the history of the planet. How does nature solve it? Well, at levels above 5,000 meters, that's around five kilometers above the Earth, when there's enough of sunlight, it energizes oxygen, which we, not, we all know. And this excited oxygen energizes its cousin, water, in the air. And when both of them are excited, they create a molecule called hydroxyl radicals, which is made up of a single atom of oxygen, single atom of hydrogen. They are very short-lived. They live for milliseconds. But as long as there is light, as long as there is oxygen, as long as there is water, they continuously produce, and they allow pollution. That's how they neutralize it. So hydroxyl radicals are called the nature's detergents. Imitating nature is not new. We've successfully done this. For example, take a solar panel. We know that in a plant, uh, chlorophyll absorbs light and converts that to glucose. The same principle was adopted in coming up with special materials called semiconductors that was integrated into the solar panels, and that converts light into electrons, which is electricity. And they don't participate in this. As long as there is light, this produces electricity, at least for 20 to 30 years. Is there a material we can use? That can, do, that can produce hydroxyl radicals? Well, what I have with me is a material called titanium dioxide. It's made up of one molecule of titanium, two molecules of oxygen. You might not know it, but you might be even wearing it, or you might be using it. This is a, this is a material that's a mineral that, that is used to provide white color. So you can see it in a paint, you can see it in your uh, toothpaste, inks, paper. Also, sometimes milk from China has titanium dioxide. But this is not the material that exhibits this property. When you're able to grind this material to 100,000th of the size of hair, it exhibits a pro property called photocatalysis. So what happens? You have light that's exposed to this material. It uses the 
water molecules and the oxygen in the air, the material gets excited. It then excites its, the, the, the cousin that we know, water, and then they create hydroxyl radicals. These are short-lived, and when there's a pollutant, they neutralize a pollu pollutant and end up creating water, carbon dioxide, and inert salts. The material was discovered, or this property was discovered by Akira Fukushima, and he's expected to win a Nobel Prize for this. The process is called Honda-Fujishima effect. Now, this is in theory. Can we really do this in practice? This is a video from a company that I'm involved with that produces a paint that imbibes the special material into it. You have a, a small building that represents an urban uh, building that's painted with the paint, and then you pump in NOx, which is a pollutant. Now, note that it's 700 parts per billion. That is representative of uh, the pollution, ten, five, five to six times the pollution level in London. And then you switch on the light, and you see more or less an immediate reduction in pollution. Note, you're continuously pu pu pumping in the pollutant, and after a while, it brings it down to more than 70%, 80%. And then we switch off the light, it becomes passive, and, goes, and the pollution level goes back up. Quite interesting, huh? Being able to use something as simple as a paint to solve a problem as big as air pollution. It inspired me. The entrepreneur who introduced me to air pollution and the inventor inspired me to start this company to solve this problem. The beauty about the material is you don't have to just use it in a paint. You can use it in, in an air conditioner, you could use it in the furniture, you could use it even in a glass. Most of the time, the problem with solving a bigger issue is not about the innovation. It's not about the invention. It's a lot to do with mindset. Air quality is not a basic need. It's a basic right. Let's fight for it. Thank you.